In her recent study of the Transfiguration of Jesus, Chicago biblical scholar and Dominican sister Barbara Reed concluded that Luke's account, which happens to be this Sunday's Gospel, probably contains the earliest form of the story. Luke chapter 9, verses 28b through 36. Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance, and his clothing became dazzling white. And look, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As they were about to part from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them, and they became frightened when they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my chosen son. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They fell silent and did not at that time tell anyone what they had seen. Two men appeared in glory and spoke of Jesus' exodus, which he was to fulfill in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. In the earliest version of this story, perhaps the two men were most likely two angels presenting an instructive message about forthcoming events for earthbound listeners. Influenced by Mark, the Lucan redactor equated these angels with Moses and Elijah and added other information from Mark. Like many historical critical biblical scholars, Sister Reed considers the evidence of this text as too fragmentary to provide scientifically certain results about what that experience really might have been. Such skepticism, however, is unwarranted. It is based upon the unexamined and unquestioned Western cultural biases that so permeate science as to be almost indistinguishable from it. Scientific cultural analyses of 488 societies from all the world's cultures have discovered that 90% of these societies routinely and normally experience alternate realities in waking visions or trances. The phrase that describes such a human experience is altered state of consciousness. Even scientifically minded Americans are familiar with some of these experiences. A favorite piece of music, a cherished painting, or even a glass of wine can produce changes in consciousness. Generally speaking, however, Americans distrust whatever they cannot control. Experiences of alternate reality are spontaneous. One allows them to happen. But since the development of science in the 17th century, Westerners have successfully blocked access to these experiences and tend to distrust or discredit those who have them. In the ancient Mediterranean world, experiences of alternate reality in vision and trance were common. Devotees of the healing god Asclepius routinely learned about their illness and appropriate therapy for it from this god in a sacred dream. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel described their experiences of God in alternate reality. The entire book of Revelation is a report of what the author, John, experienced in an altered state of consciousness that could be called an ecstasy or a trance. The literal Greek is in spirit in Revelation. In Luke's Gospel, the baptism of Jesus could be viewed as an experience of alternate reality in which one could see the sky vaults opened and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove and hear a voice speaking intelligibly. The Lucan temptation story, created as it is by tradition, 
can also be interpreted as an experience of alternate reality in an altered state of consciousness. The Transfiguration story makes good, culturally plausible sense as another such experience. It is similar to an ancient report by a translator of a book of healings by Asclepius. He took ill and went with his mother to the temple for healing. In a waking vision, she saw the god Asclepius come to him, and when she woke him to relate what she saw, before she could say anything, he informed her that he saw the same in his own dream. Jesus and his select circle of disciples share an experience of alternate reality. The text does not tell us what Jesus saw or heard, only that his face gave external indication of his experience. The text reports what Peter, James, and John saw and heard. The scene concludes with an assurance from Sky Vault. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. A common function of experiences of alternate reality is to provide enlightenment about some puzzle or guidance regarding a proper course of action to take. In Luke's storyline, Jesus' teaching and healing activities gain for him friends, but they also gain for him enemies. His fellow villagers and others wanted to kill him. It would take an experience like the Transfiguration to set the minds of Jesus and his chosen followers at ease. In spite of many ominous signs, the God of Israel was pleased with Jesus and encouraged the trio of Peter, James, and John to heed what Jesus says. Even if a biblical scholar insisted in denying that this is really what happened in history, the scenario makes very plausible Mediterranean sense. One can only admire an evangelist who created the scene if it did not happen in actual fact. My friends, the Western infatuation with science has brought in its wake blessings and curses. No one can deny the many benefits that science produces. The challenge is not to lose precious human gifts, like the capacity for mystical experiences and other experiences of alternate reality that hold an honored place in Christian tradition and piety.